For Thanksgiving weekend, you've found the Georgia gang. And topic on our agenda today, finally, it is Governor-elect Brian Kemp. The jet fuel tax is no more until June. And could Georgia's position as Hollywood South be at risk? Some of the stories up for grabs on the Georgia gang. From the Fox 5 studios, the Georgia gang starts now. And we're glad you could be with us on this Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, we hope all the tryptophan has just made you relaxed <laughs> and, and able to uh, appreciate our nation's greatness. Uh, we're going to lead off the broadcast with the Georgia gang's Lori Geary. She takes a look at the tumultuous events of the last 10 days. Well, Dick, as you know, the Georgia governor's race is officially over, but Stacey Abrams stopped short of conceding. She's now gearing up for more legal challenges as Brian Kemp prepares for his move to the governor's mansion. The fact of the matter is the election is now over, and I've got to focus on governing this state, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. Republican Governor-elect Brian Kemp made it clear he's moving on. This week, he announced his team that will help him make the transition to governor. Democrat Stacey Abrams is moving on in her own way by gearing up to file a federal lawsuit, asking the courts to hold Georgia accountable for what she calls gross mismanagement of the election. Bad actions, mismanagement, and incompetence led to the results that we have. But I can't unring a bell. Uh, in the end, it worked. Whatever system he had in place worked to the benefit of those who supported it. But what my responsibility is, is to make sure it doesn't happen to anyone else. While she acknowledged Brian Kemp as the next governor of Georgia, she also accused him of putting in unfair policies that paved his way to victory. We have laws on the books that prevent elections from being stolen from anyone. If there's things that need to be fixed, there's a place to do that. It's right upstairs during the legislative process. Stacey Abrams has also started a new nonprofit. It's called Fair Fight Georgia that will focus on an overhaul of Georgia's election laws. She also mm -hmm. says she's not leaving the political arena. She'll be back to run again, but for what office, she won't say. Well, Lori, that's the intriguing question, isn't it? I say U.S. Senate in 2020 against David Perdue. Possibly. What do you think, Lori? I think it's definitely definitely a possibility because she already is on the national stage. Um, she's very well known in Washington circles now. Hollywood too. And Hollywood mm -hmm. as well. Massachusetts. So I wouldn't Oregon, it out. Washington, California, no money from Georgia. 60% oh, of her money came from out of state. That's because it was so much money, but so much money did come from Georgia. Well, I don't know. It's, uh, we'll see. But uh, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, Theron, you, what do you think? 2020 or does she wait for John Lewis to re retire? Well, let's not um, get into this speculative game of, you know, of uh, telling her or sort of suggesting what she should run for. I do know this to Laura's point. You don't raise upwards of 30 plus million dollars and garner the support locally and nationally and get 1.9 million votes and go away. So I think that 2020 is there. Uh, Congressman Lewis is going to be in Congress as long as he wants to be there. True. Um, and so I don't I don't see him going anywhere anytime soon, especially when Democrats actually uh, have the majority in the House now. So we'll see. I, but I think the one thing I would say about Stacey Abrams is really to commend her for an outstanding campaign. I mean, Absolutely. it was remarkable. I mean, it was probably the best run campaign we've seen in Georgia in a very long time. So I think this nonprofit organization uh, that she's created, this Fair Fight Georgia, is going to be something that I think a lot of national people are going to be looking at because it's going to raise some concerns and issues and bring them to the forefront to really just improve our voting system. I mean, that's really the goal. Well, first here. of all, the General Assembly has already got that on the agenda. They're going to take care of it. Phil, I'm appalled at her behavior. A non concession, concession. Well, I think a lot of people. On the legitimacy of an elected governor? A lot of people were appalled, surprised, even among the Democratic Party. I've talked to some top Democrat officials who said she should have conceded. It damages George's image nationwide. Please. Of course, it doesn't help <clears throat> our uh, economy at all. Even the Wall Street Journal uh, this past Tuesday. Democracy succeeds in Georgia, and it just rips Stacey Abrams, claiming that voter suppression, except for there's a record turnout and record registration, including women and minorities. So, she's got to and figure out with problems. the Demo she's got to figure out with the Democratic Party: is she going to continue with this extreme rhetoric, or is she going to moderate like uh, House Leader Bob Trammell, a Democrat, just said the other day? We've got to be collegial and work with Republicans together to get things done. I think not conceding, um, I think that is an issue. 
because it's what we do. It's what we do in Georgia. Exactly. It's what we've seen. It's what we do in America. And I think even if you look to the neighbors to our south in Florida, Andrew Gillum lost by 0.5%, 34,000 votes. He conceded. Also, Bill Nelson. Well, he was great. He conceded twice. And, <laughs> and Well, Bill Nelson, too, conceded as well. And I, I just think that, you know, it's time to really heal here in Georgia. It's been so divisive. But her organization that she formed also keeps her out in, in the spotlight because it's very hard once you lose an election um, to really still be relative and, and, and important and, and have a message that's still out there. So I think it, it still keeps her relevant. Well, I think it, that she's doing exactly what she needs to do to stay in the spotlight and also to correct some things that are wrong. As she said, even though it's legal, it doesn't mean it's right. And that's what she's looking at. And that has been the history of the state. Everything, it, segregation was legal, but it wasn't right. And so some of the things that are in the voting uh, capacity are not right, like being eliminated from the rolls just because you don't vote. Well, I, I, I don't, I don't disagree with anyone about it. She's a national figure now, no question. She has a bright future in Georgia politics if she picks her race carefully. Uh, but all that said, that lack of a concession and the attack on Brian Kemp, I thought was somewhat beyond the pale. Well. And, and uh, you know, she's talking about a massive lawsuit uh, over voting irregularities. Well, everything that happened was within the law. The delays were caused, think about this now, by a federal judge, Amy Totenberg, who said that all these voting machines had to be preserved and were not used at an election that featured a record turnout for both Democrats and Republicans. How, how's and that, that was in Fulton County. Let, let me just jump in. I know you want to have everybody jump in, but I, I think we have to tell the viewer and remind the viewer that 159 counties do the election counts. It's not the Secretary of State. There's a lot of mythology there by some of Kemp's critics. And so some of these big Democratic counties, they threw out a lot of provisional ballots. And a provisional ballot, of course, you can still vote, but you have to correct what happens at the, at the polling place. For example, if you're at the wrong polling place, you vote provisionally, and you can still have your ballot counted. So I think that um, there's got to be some reform, yes, in these 159 counties, especially Fulton County. But not to cut you off, but that's coming, right? Lori, the General Assembly, one of the first three items on the ballot, on the uh, slate for January, is, a re is an overhaul of the way we vote, the very way we vote. And the new Secretary of State will have a huge say in this. And I, I agree that these elections are held but on the county level, but the Secretary of State is also the one in charge of elections. And so it's a perception also that it, it lands at his feet. That's right. And plus, he should have an overall plan for the entire state to follow. And I think where they need some clarification, and I think even some of the... Um, the registrars and everybody had agreed is that the clarification on absentee ballots and provisional ballots and when do the absentee Agreed. ballots go out there needs to be some clarification on those issues yeah you do it the old-fashioned way you move into a new place you go register to vote you show proof of, of ID you establish your address and you don't wait to the last minute and vote in the wrong county what are these people thinking? Well, we just spent, you know, almost a minute here basically bringing up all of these challenges and these problems with our voting system. So I think to sort of criticize Stacey Abrams for not conceding is a little disingenuous. Let me just tell you why. If you really listen to what she said, she said, listen, Brian Kemp will be the next governor of Georgia. But guys, this woman has been preparing to run for governor for over two years. She put a massive campaign together, came up very short for being governor. And what she also said was is that with this new organization, this lawsuit, is to continue to fight for a lot of voiceless Georgians who did go to the polls, uh, who did get turnaround. She, she focused on this 92-year-old woman in the West End who had been voting in the same precinct for over three or four decades, who basically was told she couldn't vote. And the other thing I want to dispel is that these problems just didn't happen in Democratic counties. There were some Republicans who complained about the long lines and complained about voting machines not working and also had to vote provisional ballot because they were, you know, purged or thrown off the voting roll. And so I think if we can just take the issue of race out of it and make it solely focused on the principle, and that is making it easier for people to register and easier for but people that's to vote. That's coming. That's what I, but, but, well, but, but, it's coming, but it's not. It didn't come in the last eight years when. But, but, she, she, but she, I will say we're, we're not. Been doing something. We're also not hearing these complaints from Lucy McBath. We're not hearing it from John Barrow, and we're not hearing it from Lindy Miller. So they're still trying to get elected. Right. <laughs> that's a good place for me to jump in and say that we need to talk about those runoffs. And uh, we're going to do that uh, when we come back. Stay with us.
Have a question or comment for the Georgia Gang? Email them at georgiagang at foxtv.com. So Brian Kemp is the governor-elect. He will be sworn in in January. He has named his transition team. And uh, it's an, kind of an unusual combination of establishment business people, some former politicians, and a, a pretty good-sized voice from the uh, Christian coalition. Uh, what are your thoughts, Tom Price? I think he's a healthcare genius. I think that was um, the one that surprised, I think, everybody the most, to see Tom Price's name back kind of in the political game. Um, also, I think what was interesting is Virginia Galloway, who's with the Faith and Freedom Coalition, who's a big backer of the religious freedom bills. But he also appointed Alan Fox, who's an advocate for the LGBTQ communi community, and um, he has openly oppose the religious liberty bill. So we'll see where, where that fight comes down with some of these folks. Also, one other one that I thought was interesting, Vic Reynolds, who's the Cobb County DA, very tough on crime, very tough on the gang issue. Um, so we probably will see some movement on that issue. Well, there was also another person, Reverend Mosley from Athens, uh, African-American, very popular um, pastor there who actually is very close with Brian Kemp. He also appointed a guy named Robert Finch who unsuccessfully ran for Congress and is from Athens. And so big shout out to a lot of the Athenians that are actually <laughs> on this thing. But I think that to Lori's point, uh, you know, Governor-elect Kemp is really going to try to bring a lot of folks together, similar to what Mayor-elect uh, Bottoms did when she formed her transition team. You want to get a lot of different opinions in the room to really kind of hash out some of these issues that he's going to face as governor. In the meantime, we face uh, two statewide runoffs on December 4th, I think. Mm -hmm. Have I got the date right? Yes, yes December 4th. Uh, and uh, it's Brad Raffensperger versus John Barrow for Secretary of State. And it's Lindy Miller versus Chuck Eaton for the Public Service Commission. Uh, I really don't know what to make of either race because I have no sense of what the turnout might be. Exactly. Are people's batteries still all wound up? Or? We know one thing. I think we all agree it'll be very low. <laughs> but, I think, but I think if you look at the Secretary of State's race, and, you know, and Michael Thurman had a really good quote in the paper that AJC did, and it's that if everyone who's upset about some of the irregularities that we have with voting machines, if you really want true election reform, then Democrats should really put all their efforts behind electing John Barrow because whoever the next Secretary of State is going to be, he's going to have to really make sure that some of these challenges are met. And so I think Barrow and Raffensperger won't have a money problem. I think a lot of people are going to be looking at Georgia, but it's really about how can you be memorable? What's going to make um, a voter go out in December 4th when people are coming off Thanksgiving and going into December to go out and want to vote in this race? So it's going to be a base plus election. I think Republicans and Democrats are going to do everything they can right. to get their base out. I think that Barrow right has, about that. has advantage too I, I will say this. Uh, so far, John Barrow is not echoing Stacey Abrams' claim that there's voter suppression. And I just pointed out earlier that there's more people registered to vote than ever in the state of Georgia. And so I think it's interesting that Barrow's trying to play the moderate, but I think Republicans uh, are being energized. Both bases, I think, are still energized, but they don't want someone, a Secretary of State, who is going to try to block uh, everything that a governor is trying to do in the future. Well, I think yeah. we'll get a feel for turnout this week. Early voting, voting starts. starts. Right. If you it can does. believe it, it does. <laughs> it does. Yeah. It we'll starts. get a feel of turnout uh, sometime this week. Right. The other thing that's going to be interesting is to see what happens to Robin Crittenden. Uh, who is the acting? She's got two months as Secretary of State, and then what's going to happen to her? I'm concerned about that for her. Oh, personally. she's going to end up with a, with a top job in the administration. She's a very competent manager. She, she ran DHS. Yes. Why shouldn't she? I, don't, I wouldn't worry about her. I think she's fine. Well, she lowered the temperature of all that election stuff very effectively, I thought. But the other thing is with Stacey Abrams, you know, 10 days after the election, let's make sure we point that out. It also gives the Secretary of State's office and the candidates, Linda Miller as well, we hadn't talked about the PSC right. PSC race gives them opportunity to campaign again because had this gone on a yes. little longer, I think that you couldn't have printed ballots next week uh, during early voting because you, you wouldn't have had to actually declare governor elect. Yeah. And so that was some of the things that I'm sure behind cl closed doors, the Secretary of State's office and both candidates for governor was really trying to weigh because and, and Lori sure pointed out last Stacey week they can't Abrams advertise on TV. TV. That's you know? right. Yeah. Well, my question too, Stacey Abrams in some of the interviews afterwards had mentioned John Barrow, so it'll be interesting to see if she's going to be out campaigning with him. In the meantime, sure. we yeah. had a special session of the General Assembly. Amazing. Right. And all this turmoil, <laughs> we had a special session. It lasted uh, about two and a half days, if I got that right. A little yeah. more than that. But it was the typical of Nathan Deal in his eight years as governor. It was efficient. It went off without a hitch. 
They all paid tribute to each other, but they did what he asked them to do. They passed the $470 million aid package for the Hurricane Michael victims in South Georgia, and they kept the tax off jet fuel for our airlines, mainly Delta and Southwest, without really much friction about all that. It, it, yes, it was interesting Casey to see. Cagle was out of the picture now. <laughs> <laughs> well, He's the yes. one that put the fly in the ointment. Well, oh. and, and of course, Casey Cagle, who had, who had torpedoed that, yes. presided over the Senate last week that passed it. Yes. The repeal. Exactly. That is. That's interesting. And also, I just want to point to uh, State Senator John Albers. He reported on his school safety committee. It got lost in all the uh, election stuff. But we got to remember Parkland and that awful shooting. And this committee, this uh, committee was solved, uh, was was formed to try and resolve those kinds of issues. And I thought it was interesting. A he proposes this committee proposes a counselor for every public school, two thousand of them. Mm. Now we're talking real money there, aren't we? I thought they already had that. Well, not all. I think is is the question. I think it varies. I think in Metro Atlanta, yes, but I'm. I'm not sure. But again, where does the money come from? I, I, with Alexis, I thought a lot of the schools did already have the counselors. And uh, I think it's is this middle a, and high school? I hope I don't right. like mandates from the state down to local governments. Anyway, there's exceptions to every what? rule. So there's exceptions to every rule. <laughs> but uh, I don't know if, if you want to mandate this for uh, for a but, school But Albert system. says maybe you could pay for it by expanding the definition of the East Blast, right? Mm. Which builds so right. almost yeah. all of our schools right. in this state. Right. So there's that. All right. Uh, we are running out of time here. When we come back, we've got to look at some congressional races and uh, we'll attempt to analyze the two strategies that we've, con con that we've been surrounded by almost all of 2018. Stay with us. Join the discussion on the Georgia Gang Facebook page and watch past episodes on the Georgia Gang YouTube channel. We know that Lucy McBath will succeed Karen Handel in Congress from the 6th Congressional District. And what we are reasonably sure of is that Rob Woodall uh, defeated Carolyn Bordeaux in the 7th Congressional District by maybe as few as 400 votes. But there was a recount last week and we don't have those numbers. So we're just going to assume that. But Phil, I want to turn to you because I thought you did a really excellent piece last week in Insider Advantage on exactly what happened to the Republicans. Yes. And the suburbs particularly. A couple of quick statistics that I think uh, the viewers will be interested in. Uh, terrific Republican hemorrhaging in the 29 county metro Atlanta area. We're using 29 counties for, for election and, and census purposes. Kemp only got 43%. Abrams got a whopping 56%. Now, the Kemp strategy worked in the rest of Georgia, and so Kemp got a, racked up 61% in the rest of the state, Abrams only 38%. And so uh, this is a, a discussion in both parties that's going to occur. What do we do with our strategy? Uh, the Republicans, of course, have to pivot and make up for the hemorrhaging of votes in, in some of these suburban counties. I know we're going to be talking about suburban that Suburban women time. with college degrees. Uh, and that's, that's one target that the Republicans have to work on. Uh, Gwinnett County was a big Republican gain. Uh, they gained uh, up from six points from Democrats. Hillary Clinton Democrats. to 14. Democrats. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> thank you. And then lastly, I'm rolling off these statistics, and I'll be quiet after this one. The Republicans are happy with Cherokee and Forsyth County. They delivered a whopping 88,000 votes, which keeps them in the game. And apparently elected Rob Woodall. And, and, right. and, and Forsyth elected Rob, <laughs> Rob Woodall. Those votes came in very late. Now, <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For me, I want to talk about the Democrats a little bit because I felt like I've been in a, a bug in a jar. I have a millennial daughter who is no longer registered to vote in Georgia. She's registered to vote in Texas. She got five door knocks in a neighborhood that I suspect of 154 homes, 120 of them are Republican. Five door knocks asking for my young daughter uh, on behalf of the Democratic Party. She got five postcards, handwritten, mm -hmm. presumably by her peers. She got untold phone calls and texts. This drew out of the Ossoff special election a year ago. Theron, the idea for Ossoff was 15 contacts, 
with every millennial or minority voter. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, John Ossoff really, you know, sort of paved the way um, for a Lucy Metbath campaign. But I still think that the Metbath campaign, and we talked about this, her messaging around, um, you know, to suburban healthcare. women around health care, yeah. but also to bring the issue of gun safety and gun control in that district. But, you know, I think, you know, Senator Miller said it best, and, you know, he's going to be missed down in the legislature. I know he's someone that Democrats uh, had the pleasure of working with on some key issues in DeKalb County. And I'm paraphrasing his quote in the paper, but he, he warned his GOP colleagues. I mean, he said that um, that he cautioned them to really look deeply into some of these social issues. And I think he referenced abortion, you know, abortion regulations. And he also referenced uh, RIFRA. And he also went and said, look, if Donald Trump is the nominee in 2020, then Republicans in Georgia are going to be in a very tough position. Well, he, he also warned them not to write off the suburbs. But, but what he said was is that while these social issues like abortion and uh, RIFA it, it ignites the rural Republican voter, it turned all to suburbanites. Lori, as an addendum to what Phil said, uh, some of these legislators, like Senator Fran Miller, mm -hmm. ran well ahead of Brian Kemp. Mm -hmm. I think he ran nine points ahead of Kemp in his state Senate district. But I think Republicans are going to look inward and, and talk about their strategy because the strategy the last two election cycles has right. been to target rural Georgia. We know the population is shrinking a little bit there and it's increasing in the metro areas. And so that's going to be a big problem even in 2020 for Senator David Perdue. Um, and I think two issues to really for Republicans to rally around to attract women, it's it's the gun control and gun safety. When you have somebody like Lucy McBath I'm who can you. win the sixth district on really a single issue. I know she talked about health care, but that was a single issue race. Mm -hmm. And also Donald Trump, a lot of those suburban women, while they may agree on his policy, they don't like him and they don't like what he stands for. So they can't vote for anybody aligned with him. And who is the biggest supporter in the Senate of Donald Trump? David so Perdue. Right. So it also makes you realize that I think the Kemp campaign made a very fundamental decision to not debate Stacey Abrams but to bring Donald Trump into Macon and what they did was is that they knew that all right we don't get the rural vote out we're getting hammered right now in the suburban counties in 29 counties we have to drive up the numbers but then I think also when you dissect the numbers I mean Abrams did well in some of these rural counties yes. below Macon that had been a sort of Republican stronghold for a very long time. You know she did I, yeah. but I, I want to make a footnote to that I think she hurt herself with those same voters that voted for her these swing voters independent mm -hmm. voters moderates, whatever you want to call them, when with this uh, very angry and bitter uh, non-concession speech. So I think she hurt herself. Oh, she, listen, I, I, listen to I, I the speech. That's you. all I, I ask. I've got to interrupt she you all. all. She wasn't yeah. angry at all. We're not going to have time to talk about Hollywood South and the threat <laughs> to our $10 billion a year film industry in well, the state. Well, Stacey Abrams came out and basically told them not to abandon Georgia. She wrote right. a very detailed and plus, statement. And yeah. somebody needs to tell the governor-elect not to go with this RIFRA business. Because that's what... RIFRA's the law of the land, Alexis. Well, then leave it 1993. be. 1993, the why, law why, of the why, land. Why do we need another law And why did Amazon pick two states that have RIFRA? I don't know the answer to that question, Dick. <laughs> no, we, we need <laughs> RIFRA. No, no, we don't. Federal version, absolutely. Federal Simple. version, that's a difference. It's good enough for the well, nation, it's good what, enough for Georgia. Well, why? Do you, it's redundant. We don't need redundancy. <laughs> All right, when we come back, uh, winners and losers, stay with us. Time now for the week's winners and losers. We're not supposed to be in a hurry on a busy, on a relaxing Thanksgiving weekend, <laughs> but we are. Theron, winners and losers. Two winners. Uh, Ivory Lee, I'm sorry, Ivory Young, um, Ivory Lee Young Jr. passed away this week, uh, city councilman for District 3. Uh, wonderful uh, public servant. He's going to be missed. Also, uh, Sue Ross, who retired after being in the city of Atlanta for 37 years with the Atlanta Department of Watershed Management. So definitely want to uh, salute those two people. I got some winners with uh, James Magazine's Influential Georgians uh, event. Nick Ayers, Vice President, uh, Mike Pence's Chief of Staff, was the Georgian of the Year. And uh, it was a bipartisan group of lawmakers honored Butch Miller, the Senator, uh, President Pro Tem, and Bob Trammell, the um, Democrat uh, House Leader, and John, uh, uh, by the way, uh, uh, Jack Hill, also Senate Appropriations. I do want to do a shout out for the late John Meadows, who was the uh, House Rules uh, Committee Chairman, respected on both sides of the aisle. He will be missed. All I'll right, do two Lori. quick winners. Atlanta United in the playoffs. Oh, yeah. Very exciting. And also, Alexis Scott, congratulations <laughs> on your nuptials. Well, thank you. Thank yes. you. I appreciate that. Very you want nice. to show off the ring? 
<laughs> yeah. No. Okay, go, 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 go. All right, we don't have time. Clock ticks. Uh, I'm going to say happy 80th birthday to Ted Turner. He was celebrated mm -hmm. for his philanthropy, for his business acumen, and everything else that he did for, to serve Atlanta. Also, uh, we need to recognize Matt Collins. He passed. Yeah. I'm one of the Republican pioneers in the state, Matt Collins, congressman from the South Metro, mm -hmm. part of the Newt Gingrich revolution, and uh, a kind of a old-fashioned Georgia politician, kind of a nice guy, just kind of quiet and nice That's fella. Right. And uh, I want to uh, pay a little tribute to uh, the longtime retired chairman of Bell South, Franklin Skinner. Frank Skinner was a great civic leader in many cities in the South, but particularly Atlanta. And uh, he, if, if his name was on it, it worked. And that worked for the Chamber of Commerce, the Rotary Club, all manner of things. He died at 87. And how about a praise for a Democrat, Scott Holcomb, uh, the Democrat who represents part of North DeKalb. He got that rape kit backlog cleared up at the GBI and was able to celebrate it. That was kind of a scandal, and he used his will to fix it. And uh, so there we are. Happy Thanksgiving from the Georgia Gang. See you next week. The opinions expressed in this broadcast are those of the panelists appearing in this program. 